So we'll start. Good afternoon to all. I This is the period of session of the 185 period of, of session, which is entitled the impact of the criminalization law which affect the LGTBI people in the region and which was colonial motion. Uh, my name is Julissa Falcon, president of the Commission. I am here joined by Commissioner May Macaulay, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosimena Retinio, and Commissioner Roberta Clark, reporter for LGTBI. Here we also have the Secretary Tanya Renault. I would like to start greeting the civil society, thanking their participation in this hearing, and we're going to explain the use of the time. We're going to start with the organizations, which will take the floor during 40 minutes, then the commission for 20 minutes, and then during 30 minutes, we will have the second round of comments. I will give the floor to the civil society organizations. Please be aware of the use of the time. We have a clock here. I don't want to cut you off, so uh, I would like you to uh, manage the use of the time. Thank you. You may start. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Honorable President of the Commission other commissioners, secretariat staff, colleagues, good afternoon to you all. First, I wanna thank the commission for this opportunity to speak on the impacts of criminalization on LGBTIQ people in the Americas region. I'm Joel Simpson, managing director of SASA Guyana, and I'm joined by colleagues from CAISO and SASA Guyana. Both organizations are members of the LGBTTI, and Sex Workers Coalition of the Americas. Our organizations are also a part of the Caribbean Forum for Liberation and Acceptance of Genders and Sexualities, Carry Flags, the Pan-Caribbean LGBTIQ Network. While our presentation will focus on our home countries, Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana, we will take this opportunity to present an overview on the impacts of criminalization in the Caribbean region through recent research findings. These will be briefly highlighted by Dr. Angelique Nixon, Director of CAISO. Then Kellogg, Research and Program Associate at CAISO, will present on the impacts of criminalization on LGBTIQ people in Trinidad and Tobago. After Kellogg's presentation, Sasad Ghana's Human Rights Coordinator, Melina Harris, will present on the situation in our country. Our group, of prevents, our group of presenters is very happy to answer questions, respond to comments, and engage with the commission on this very important topic after our very brief presentations. So now I will hand you over to Dr. Angelique Nixon from CAISO. Thank you so much, Joelle Simpson, and greetings to everyone on the call, protocols observed to all the commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to just briefly share a few of the recent uh, research studies that have been across the Caribbean region to offer some context in particular for the impacts of violence on LGBTQI plus persons in the region as a result of a lack of protection against discrimination and anti-LGBT plus laws. The recent study in 2021 by Open for Business called the Economic Case for LGBT Plus Inclusion in the Caribbean, focus on 12 countries in the English-speaking Caribbean. This report affirms what we have experienced on the ground across the region, that the challenges that LGBT Plus people in the Caribbean confront on a daily basis can be stark. State-sponsored homophobia and transphobia are prevalent, as is social stigma. Some of the key findings of that report, they are numerous, and I encourage you to look at the report as well as the others I will mention today. The countries that decriminalize same-sex acts are likely to benefit from increased labor productivity. And the survey further found that high levels of violence with a diminished capacity to seek justice was very prevalent across the region. And so the report demonstrates the cost of LGBT plus discrimination, exclusion, and violence, and particularly revealing what we know from our work on the ground in civil society, that for many LGBT plus people, violence and exclusion begins in the family, 
impacts well-being, mental health, social economic status, and opportunities in life. Another report from 2022 titled Discrimination at Every Turn, the Experiences of Trans and Gender Diverse People in 11 Caribbean Countries by UC Trans and Outright Action International, a survey of 119 trans and gender diverse people, one of the first of its kind, uh, and importantly, including Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, the Bahamas, Guyana, Haiti, Barbados, Suriname, Dominican Republic, St. Lucia, Aruba, and Belize. The, res the research findings of this report reveal that trans and gender diverse people face discrimination in education and employment based on gender identity and expression with little legal recourse. A number of the recommendations from this report align with what civil society has been calling for across the region, from extending and enacting anti-discrimination protections, repealing discriminatory laws, and ensuring legal gender identity recognition, among other important uh, calls for training, guidelines, access to health care, and so on. And then finally, I want to share a summary of From Fringes to Focus which is a deep dive into the lived realities of lesbian, bisexual, and queer women and transmasculine persons in eight Caribbean countries. This another groundbreaking study, the first of its kind to focus on queer, lesbian, bisexual women and transmasculine people. The survey of over a thousand LBQ and transmasculine people responding to a survey affirmed many key findings and insights commonly reported across civil society, including employment challenges, economic instability, a lack of access to health care, and the devastating impacts of the stigma and discrimination that continue, and the heightened experiences of violence, both in the family and public spaces, as well as in intimate partnerships. These recent regional studies and research reveal and support what LGBTQI plus organizations and activists have shared in our work and experiences. I offer these overviews to situate the country specific reports you will now hear and encourage you to review these findings. They're easily accessible online in terms of these re recent reports and will be available in our written report to you. I now am happy to turn over to my colleague, Kellogg in Kimokalam, our research and program associate with Kaiso Sex and Gender Justice, who will share insights from our work, particularly through our Wholeness and Justice program over the past two years. Kellogg. Thank you, Angelique. Due to the lack of protections afforded to LGBTQ plus people and a few avenues for accessible and meaningful redress, Kaiso Sex and Gender Justice responds to violations experienced by LGBTQI plus people through its Wholeness and Justice program. Essentially, the program places an emphasis on trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming, and intersex people. The services provided are free to clients and offer clinically competent trauma-informed interventions that enable healing and resilience. Kaiso defines violations as breaches of human rights, infringements on safety, and impeded access to public services. These violations point to the impact of anti-LGBT plus laws in Trinidad and Tobago. These laws remain unchanged even with the decriminalization judgment in 2018 because of the appeal process by the government, which has indicated that no related laws to the judgment would be changed until the appeal process is complete. The lack of protections on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity and the glaring gaps in legislation, policies, and social services informs our work. Hence, we continue to call for amendments to the Equal Opportunity Act in Trinidad and Tobago that will remove the exclusion of sexual orientation and expand protections to include LGBTI plus status. Key insights from Kaiso's work reveal the everyday institutional and social discrimination and lack of access to freedoms and protections which LGBTQI plus people experience as a result of anti-LGBT plus laws in Trinidad and Tobago. Specifically, the data collected from clients in 2021 identified the main challenges being access to safe and affordable housing and employment opportunities exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The report confirmed the impacts of continued institutional and social discrimination against LGBTQ plus people, 
This is more apparent in the lack of codified protections for persons on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. The report revealed that there is a continued need for substantive and procedural legal support for LGBTQI plus people, as many may not know that they have been violated or that redress may be available. The program has provided legal assistance with lodging police reports, requesting police intervention and assistance with service of court documents, submitting applications and the general conduct of legal matters, among other services. Many who come to the program shared general anxieties surrounding engaged in legal processes, with some opting to not pursue legal redress due to fear for their safety and retaliation. To date, the program has engaged 77 people and currently offers services to 34 active clients. Of these clients, 16 presented with a legal issue. Majority of the clients with a legal issue are receiving supplemental clinical and or homeless development services to support them through the legal processes involved. Most of our clients and people who approach the program have been negatively affected by anti-LGBTQI plus laws and lack of protections in Trinidad and Tobago. In attempting to access employment, housing, goods or services, public and private, in Trinidad and Tobago, LGBTQI plus people are often met with stigma and discrimination, with the active omission of LGBTQI plus status as a protected category in the Equal Opportunity Act, community members, when denied for this reason, are unable to seek redress through the supposedly anti-discrimination act. State agencies and public servants are complicit in discrimination and violence experienced by LGBTQI plus people. At least seven, of, seven clients of the program have experienced violence at the hands of police officers. These forms of violence include an abuse of power, refusal to provide services, including report taking, attempts to ridicule, humiliate, and intimidate LGBTQI plus persons, persons who they perceive to be LGBTQI plus and matters in relation to LGBTQI plus people and experiences. These behaviors are consistent in national social services agencies and among healthcare providers where people have been denied services or were treated with extreme prejudice during the service delivery. Often these perpetrators enjoy impunity. This is largely because some of these perpetrators act as gatekeepers to redress. Our legislative framework does not adequately capture experiences of violence that are specific to LGBTQI plus people, and therefore possible pathways to redress are obstructed by intersecting issues that include lack of resources and support. Our work with clients and community engagement has also revealed the extent to which people of trans experience and diverse gender expression are exempted from the formal economy and access to healthcare. This aligns with recent research that identifies the vulnerability of trans and gender diverse people across the region. The challenges remain stigma and discrimination rooted in the social and institutional denial of their right to personhood. The majority of trans clients in the program have expressed that because of a lack of access to formal work, they engage in sex work, which is criminalized and therefore unregulated. This results in greater vulnerabilities and violence from individuals and the state. LGBTQI plus people are generally exposed to discrimination on the basis of their sexual orientation and or gender identity in the workplace. Even though the Equal Opportunity Act intends to prohibit discriminatory behavior in the workplace and protect employees from unfair treatment in employment practices, this protection is not extended to LGBTQI plus people. Therefore, it actively fails LGBTQI plus people. One such person is a trans client of the program who was unlawfully detained and verbally and physically abused by a potential employer who claimed she was there to deceive them. Currently, the program is pursuing three legal matters involving police abuse of authority, unfair dismissal, and discrimination in the workplace. These forms of discrimination correlate with the financial and economic instability experienced by some of our clients. It prevents them from being able to sustain themselves, especially for trans people and young LGBTQI plus adults. We have received many reports from young people who endure family violence because they have few choices with limited options for employment. Some have to choose between enduring abusive behavior from family members for the sake of shelter or standing up to them with a high likelihood of displacement and housing instability. In cases where persons have chosen to leave their abusive households or even when they are kicked out, they have to deal with a housing market with landlords who are homophobic and transphobic. 
People who identify or who are perceived as LGBTQI plus are routinely denied access to housing since there are no policies or protections afforded to LGBTQI plus people. This is the reality of 30 people who were recorded by the program as experiencing housing stability in this year alone. The program has had to coordinate responses to this through the provision of food, rental and medical support, social services navigation and other wholeness development mechanisms. In closing, Anti-LGBT plus laws, lack of protection against discrimination and criminalization heightens vulnerabilities of LGBTQI plus people in Trinidad and Tobago. These prevent people from pursuing and attaining the quality of life that all people are supposed to have the opportunity to live with dignity. Further, the lack of protection exposes LGBTQI plus people to violence and harmful behaviors, which also affects the ability to access services safely. Even when they have experienced a violation, the fear of stigma and discrimination affects their willingness to seek redress. This is the reality of the work underground in Trinidad and Tobago, but several anti-LGBTQI plus laws prevent our communities from full access to living lives of dignity. Even with the 2018 judgment, the appeal process continues, and to date, there remains no protection against discrimination. We see and experience backlash which directly affects LGBTQI plus people on a daily basis in the workplace, in healthcare, in homes, in schools, in day-to-day -day living. Kaiso has been responding to this and engaged in provision of services through our Homeless and Justice Program. And we are thankful for the opportunity to share the data and insights collected over the past two years. We now turn over to our colleague in Guyana at SASA to share their report. Melina. Thank you and good afternoon, colleagues, uh, Madam President, Commissioners, uh, Secretariat, good afternoon to you all. Uh, Guyana continues to be among uh, only a handful of countries in the Americas region where same-sex intimacy between consenting adults is criminalized. In recent years, there have been a series of decisions from Caribbean courts declaring laws which criminalize same-sex intimacy as unconstitutional, as they violate the fundamental rights and freedoms of LGBTIQ plus persons. Despite these advances around the region, however, Guyana continues to uphold the buggery law and other harmful legislation while taking no steps to introduce legislation which would protect LGBTIQ plus people in Guyana from discrimination and hate crimes. The impacts of criminalization of same-sex intimacy are deeply felt among LGBT people in Guyana where homophobia and transphobia continue to be a part of the social norm, largely because many Guyanese are aware of the Bugri law, which specifically prohibits intimacy between men. As, attitude, as such, attitudes which fuel discrimination and prejudice are deeply held by people who argue that these acts are legally prohibited so their own disapprobation of LGBT people is then justified. This festers a culture of stigma, discrimination, hatred, and violence. Over the years, Sasad Guyana and other local civil society groups have been working with the Caribbean Vulnerable Communities Coalition to document and investigate human rights violations. I will now share the data that these Guyanese organizations have collected through the shared incidents database for the period January 2021 to August 2022. During this period, Sasot Guyana documented 26 incidents of physical violence against transgender persons and 10 incidents of physical violence against gay and bisexual men. There were 14 cases of intimate partner violence perpetuated against transgender persons and seven cases perpetuated against gay and bisexual men. There were 10 cases involving gay and bisexual men who reported emotional abuse and 13 cases involving transgender persons. Cross-dressing was formally decriminalized and removed from Guyana's laws last year in August 2021, following a successful, successful decision from the Caribbean Court of Justice, Guyana's highest court, in November 2018. However, since then, attitudes and perceptions towards transgender people in Guyana continue to be negative, often culminating in extreme social, social isolation, physical and verbal abuse, sexual assault, and extreme economic impoverishment for these communities. From the data I've shared with you, there are clear intersections of discrimination for transgender people in particular. For example, Sasa Guyana has been documenting multiple incidents of verbal and physical assault against a transgender woman living with HIV who is a sex worker. 
The client is 25 years old and has reported that she's been the victim of multiple incidents involving her neighbors who physically assaulted her with weapons and alarmingly on one occasion, even fired a loaded gun at her as she was leaving her home. The client has a long history of reporting these and other extremely violent incidents which have been perpetuated against her to the Guyana police force. As such, she's become well known to many of the police officers who she feels do not take her complaints seriously because she is a transgender woman. As a matter of fact, none of the incidents that the client has reported to the Guyana police force have resulted in any prosecution or conviction of any identifiable perpetrator. Nonetheless, the victim has continued to document these incidents with Sasot Guyana because she does not trust the police to ensure her protection nor investigate any of these incidents. Sasot Guyana has intervened and represented the clients on a number of occasions with the Guyana police force. However, these interventions have only led to limited outcomes. The client has not experienced any form of redress for the violations that she suffered. Furthermore, this client's case highlights a crucial link between criminalization and socioeconomic exclusion. The client mentioned above has also made numerous reports to Sasot Guyana regarding a housing dispute with her landlord. According to the client's report, her landlord wanted her to vacate owing to late payments of rent and ongoing disputes between the client and the landlord concerning the client's occupation as a sex worker. The client made a number of reports to the police stating that the landlord had broken into the property and destroyed her belongings. However, nothing was done to prevent the landlord from doing this on multiple occasions. Sasot Guyana intervened and ensured a report was filed with the police and assisted the client in seeking alternative accommodation. Finding appropriate housing for the client had also been a challenge. However, appropriate housing was eventually found and the client was successfully removed from an incredibly hostile living environment. Many of the issues raised by this particular client highlight the impact of criminalization and its relationship with discrimination against LGBT persons in almost all meaningful areas of their lives. For instance, the study by the Georgetown Law Human Rights Institute entitled Trapped, Cycles of Violence Against Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Persons in Guyana found that stigma and discrimination against LGBT people in Guyana permeated all areas of their lives. According to the study, testimonials gathered from LGBT persons all indicated that they encountered significant barriers to accessing justice. There are issues with access to justice because LGBT persons do not trust the police nor the system to protect them from violence and crime, nor do they approach the police in times of need because they do not believe that the police are likely to act in their best interests with many fearing that they in turn will be prosecuted because they are LGBT people. These are sentiments often expressed by victims when documenting and reporting human rights violations with Sasod Guyana. The tract report also found that much of the violence against LGBT persons is fueled by sociocultural norms and discriminatory laws which reinforce these homophobic and transphobic prejudices. Those discriminatory laws, including the criminalization of same-sex intimacy between consenting adults, fuel further violence by impeding access to justice. Enforcing those laws can also lead to police corruption and prevent victims of human rights violations from reporting crimes motivated by their actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity and expression for fear of being criminalized in return. The social stigma against homosexuality furthered by those laws makes victims reluctant to test existing redress mechanisms like the Police Complaints Authority and the Police Service Commission. The trapped report also highlights that this mistrust of essential state services extends to other important areas such as access to suitable and appropriate health care for LGBT populations. According to the study, most of the interviewees reported experiencing significant barriers to accessing public health care because of extreme stigma and discrimination encountered at health facilities in Guyana because of their actual or perceived LGBT status. To conclude, Sasot Guyana wishes to inform the Commission that despite the many examples of human rights violations I've mentioned here today, there are also positive changes that are occurring which indicate that Guyanese society 
is ready for decriminalization of same-sex intimacy. Recently, Sasad Guyana commissioned a national poll which revealed huge changes in attitudes and perceptions towards LGBT people in Guyana. According to results from the 2022 poll, LGBT, LGBT acceptance in Guyana has soared since 2013 when the first poll of its kind was conducted by the Caribbean Development Research Services. Over the nine year period since then, LGBT acceptance increased from 19% to 34.5%. Overall, a total of 72.4% of respondents stated that they accepted or tolerated LGBT persons in the 2022 poll. Notably, hatred of LGBT people has decreased by over 50% from 25% in 2013 to 12% in 2022, which is quite significant. Other key results include that nearly a majority of Guyanese believe that government should prioritize legally protecting the rights of LGBT people with 49.6% of respondents replying <laughs> positively that it should be a priority of the government to prioritize legally protecting LGBT people. Furthermore, the poll found that a clear majority of 53.9% of the Guyanese population are likely to support the elimination of the law criminalizing sex between men. Results also showed that 72% of the population were likely to support legislation that ensures protection against workplace discrimination for LGBT people in Guyana. Altogether, very Sorry. positive, encouraging results. I thank you. Buenas tardes, soy Victoria. Good afternoon. My name is Victoria Raidu of CELS. In Argentina, uh, the gender identity law was passed in, 2020, in 2012. Despite being an important regional regulatory advance, the trans and uh, gay population still faces constant acts of discrimination. The crimes of possession of drugs for personal consumption and for sale to consumers, as well as the contravention of offering sex work in public spaces are the main tools used by the police often in combination to promote a repertoire of abusive practices against this specific group. Extortion threats, sexual abuse, arbitrary arrests, disproportionate use of the force, and the filing of fraudulent legal cases are the most common practices. The judiciary reinforces this violation of rights against these specific groups by validating police actions and also through its own interventions. For example, the non-recognition of self-perceived gender in the judicial process. In Argentina, drug policies are framed within the prohibitionist model of the war against drug trafficking. There's a law that condenses prohibitions of all behaviors related to narcotics. The implementation of this policy focuses on the prosecution of micro-traffickers, small case dealers, and consumers. In 2017, 70% of the trans population deprived of liberty was deprived of liberty for that crime. Detention conditions are deplorable for the entire population. Overcrowding, the uh, precarious characteristics of the places, and the deficient assistance to detainees are common and aggravated for trans and transvestites ill-treatment, torture by, pers by prison staff, and obstacles to access health care take on a sexualized and more widespread connotation. When we're talking about a population that uh, are people who are deprived of their liberty without a conviction. And this, sometimes they even spend a longer um, time. For example, one... Um, test might take even three years. Sex works is not penalized in the penal in the criminal code, but it does appear in most of the provincial codes and they function as punitive instruments against vulnerable sectors of society. Situations of institutional violence in the context of persecution of sex work fall more heavily on the transvestite and trans population as revealed in a report by the Asociación Mujeres Meretrices de la Argentina. It is important to note 
that sex work has historically been a method of illicit enrichment of the police and an excuse to perform tasks of population control. This situation was further aggravated during the pandemic. Transgender sex workers were particularly affected by police controls and the risks associated with these controls due to the need to continue developing their activity in order to survive in this context. Thank you very much. Distinguished commissioners, my name is Ivan Chanis Barahona, president of Fundación Iguales Panamá. This is the third time that the foundation is before you to denounce the situation of, and, of neglect and discrimination towards LGBTQI plus population in Panama. Today, the laws that persist discrimination of our life and love, the separation from the benefits of a democratic system. In December 2018 and in the October 2020, we presented our case. And today I report before this extreme distinguished commission that no, not, not, absolutely nothing has improved in Panama. Quite the contrary, we have regressed in compliance with inter-American human rights standards. Invisibilization criminalizes us, perpetuates stigma, generates vi violence, and keeps us away from social development of that context. In Panama, we do not have a law to protect against discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. The LGBT population is not recognized as vulnerable population. There is no protection system in the country against violence and discrimination. Can you just speak a little bit more slowly where I'm losing you? Just uh, maybe more slowly. Thank you. De, de igual forma, el reglamento general de los bomberos expedido hace the general regulation of the firefighters issue only 11 years ago also includes it's a series of things in Article 156. These offenses are punishable by 30 days of arrest, suspensions, demotions in the career, or even dismissal. In 2020, we denounced the arbitrary detention of a young lesbian couple for kissing in public. Police assaulted and interrogated them until they were illegally detained and then fined. Despite the request for a waiver of the disorderly conduct at churches, the justice of the peace held, upheld the conviction without informing the defendants. This generated a contempt of court that carries a prison sentence until the debt is paid. Is paid. In addition, homosexuals are not allowed to donate blood. A resolution of the Ministry of Health regulating the operation of blood bank expressly excludes homosexuals as donors. Only the last year, the general adoption law was approved, which legalizes a prohibition for same-sex couples to adopt. These even, though there is a provision against legislating against the same rights of same-sex couples established by the advisory opinion OC24. And there are not only laws, but also public policies contrary to the American Convention. There are public policies that are violence towards sexually diverse population, the legislative setback which, with new laws that prevent the formation of diverse families, institutionalized violence of the security forces that can be perceived as a moral policy against non heteronormative practice, or this in a country that refuses to recognize since 2016 the civil marriage of same-sex couple with four cases in the Supreme Court of Justice and the Electoral Tribunal and the refusal to the institution to recognize the identity of trans people. Hello, I am Maria Luisa Peralta from ACATA team working with the sexuality gender. In 2021, an initiative called Law to Guarantee the Comprehensive Protection of Children and Adolescents Against Gender, gender Identity Disorder was introduced in the Legislative Assembly of Guatemala, which prohibits the dissemination of information referring to gender identity or gender expression. In educational institutions, a law seeks to explicitly prohibit these topics from being part of sex education programs. Trans organizations in Guatemala are risk because the bill is in the second reading in the Cong Congress of the Republic and in the midst of an electoral campaign plagued with the hate speech and misinformation about comprehensive sex education. Sex work is not regulated at the national level in any country in the Americas and systematic violations of sex workers' rights persist. The municipal level tends to be the most restrictive one. In many countries, there is striking discrepancy between health, public safety, and other legislation, making it difficult to defend their rights. For example, a 24-year-old Colombian sex worker living in San Jose, Costa Rica, 
in 2019 almost lost her children when she told her mother that she was a lesbian and her mother reported her to the family justice system because of her sexual orientation and her work. Another 23-year-old lesbian sex worker in Costa Rica was subjected to situations of violence by clients because of sexual orientation. The testimony of a 24-year-old sex worker from Bolivia shows the dynamics of discrimination and exclusion based on sexual orientation. In Argentina, Eva Nalia Higi de Jesus is a male gender expressive working class lesbian living in the province of Buenos Aires. In 2016, she was attacked by a group of men who habitually harassed her for being a lesbian. They attempted a gun to rape to, to her and they wanted to rape her to make her a woman. The Jesus defended herself with a knife, knife mortally wounding one of them. The others left her semi-conscious after vicious beating. The police arrested her without medical attention. She was charged with murder in prison for eight months and released pending trial. In 2017, a policeman tried to arrest Marian Gomez, a male lesbian who was kissing his wife with the excuse of smoking in a prohibited place. Currently in the Argentine city of Necochea, Perina Nochetti is at risk of criminal prosecution for graffiti asking where is the well, a young transgender man who has been missing since March 2021, and he had gone for a job interview. Perina is a state worker lesbian trained in a comprehensive sexual education and environmental activist. She has been suffering harassment in her work, including the suspension of different workshops, salary reduction, and pre precariousness. The graffiti was painted in February 2022 during the week of Pride March, and the only evidence to accuse Pierina Nocchetti is a photo showing three people with their backs turned. It is not possible to identify her as the author. She risks uh, facing she faces a risk of losing her job, and she is mother of three children. Finally, HIV criminalization continues the laws used to undermine public health messages about getting tested and started treatment are applied even if there is no transmission of the virus. In Canada, 20, 224, in Brazil, 36, and in Mexico, 20 people. Thank you very much. You still have four minutes. Eh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Giovanni Primate. I represent the organization Venezuela Igualitaria in Venezuela, and we're here specifically to report a case, which is a law that violates the dignity of people. And it's a law which is called the Organic Code of Military Justice. In Venezuela, I hear the reality of other countries and I feel a little bit more comfortable. Well, because at least here we have some regulations that somehow dignify our citizenship in paper. There are, there are certain laws such as the banking law, the law of the power, pop, power popular, population, the, um, that protect explicitly sexual orientation as one of the non-discrimination criteria. However, there is the section 565 of the Organic Code of Military Justice of Venezuela, which explicitly explains that the official that commits acts against the military decorum will be in prison for one year to three years and they will be separated from the army and the same uh, this punishment will be applied to any official that commits act, acts against nature this is in a book in this second volume of the different types of crimes and this is called the chapter of cowardice and other crimes against military decorum therefore this act 
is being considered an act of cowardice and a crime against military decorum. So we went to the Supreme Court in 2016 to raise a complaint for its unconstitutionality of that article within the framework of the International Day of Human Rights. However, these uh complaint was admitted in 2020. We should underscore that this article has been used to undermine the rights of people that in the exercise of their rights and they are exposed to torture and cruel treatment such as having medical forensic examinations to determine whether they were penetrated and to analyze the semen which is found in the vehicles where they carried out those sexual acts these in these judgments they expose the identity of these people their address where they are um, of those who are in the military service but also of their couple or the one who was having the sexual acts with them however nowadays these Since this uh, claim was made, the actions of the military has, have decreased, but there are other legal instruments that are not constitutional. Even though in 2015, the ministry of the defense published in an official gazette that the uh, sexual orientation and the right to sexual orientation is warranted. And we have people who have been identified through social media such as TikTok, where an official of the armed forces is identified who is doing a TikTok uh, post with their couple and this is used as evidence to expel them from the military and these uh, documents are published and these people are exposed to public opinion. Thank you. Thank you for the civil society for their participation. Now the Inter-American Commission will start. I will give the floor to the second vice president, Margaret May Macaulay, please. Thank you, Madam President. I had hoped that you would you would go first to the rapporteur on LGBTI rights. Um, I um, I have been not so active in the, in regard to this, but I thank all of you. Good afternoon, everyone, for the superb um, information that you have provided, and I'm happy to see the faces of my, my colleague, sister commissioners here, and um, the sister executive secretary. It seems as if we're all women from the commission today, are we? That's interesting. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, I know that, uh, um, I, I I know about my country, Jamaica, but I'm not supposed to speak uh, of, um, of it. And, and am I? Can I? About the laws? <laughs> As it is a, a regional hearing, I wish you I, make uh, regional references to the topic. But yes. the thing is, I cannot really make regional references. I do know. Um, we, we traditionally we've had a serious problem in the Caribbean, but one another thing which I do know is that over the years, even the countries which were the most dangerous 
um, to life and limb of, LG, of persons of the LGBTI communities are not in that position as much in the Caribbean today. Um, um, so therefore, there seems to be what I call a growing up process in, in the, um, the attitudes of society um, and societies in the Caribbean countries towards persons of the LGBTI communities. And which, which gives one a hope. And when I heard the um, statistical percentages from Guyana, from uh, Malini, I, I, I was filled with, with a lot of hope um, in relation to that. And I, I wanted to ask whether the, the, they have been the processes and works and lobbyings and all that they've been doing in Guyana has been shared with other Caribbean countries. Uh, um, because it, it would be interesting to know how closely the, the, the organization, civil society, in the sub-region of the Caribbean are working closer together to achieve the necessary changes which we must have in the region to ensure that discrimination, um, which they have traditionally and and and, and which has become so became structural, um, must end. Um, so, um, I know that our laws are very archaic, and and remain so. The language one finds rather embarrassing when one reads the provisions of the acts. Uh, um, and that is one, one um, means that one can use to lobby for amendments, at least, um, to the laws. And also to convince members of the judiciary who are forward-looking um, that perhaps even merely making comments from the bench when there are cases yeah. before mm -hmm. them would assist. Um, there are not as many cases in some countries um, as there were before, in some, not none at all. And one wonders whether the police themselves have uh, are taken a more mature attitude um, and a more human rights uh, position in relation to these archaic offenses in, our, in law books. Um, I, I, I think the question I really would like to know is how closely the, the civil societies in the region, the sub-region and in the larger region of the Americas are working together to move the agenda forward um, for equality and proper access to justice and a true equal society for all. Thank you. Eh, Thank you, Commissioner Macaulay. And following the protocol, I will give the floor to uh, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena. Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon to everybody. I would like to send a great hug to you and to thank you for your trust, for sharing with us your anguish, your claims. I would like to first greet our uh, my good friend, Ivan. I really know his struggles in my country. He's always uh, leading great struggles. And when I hear the position of the different regions, I need to state that even though we can say that we have moved forward, that we have some achievements in terms of human rights, but when we see this list of the violation of all rights, on the part of the authorities, 
of the institutions themselves, well, we realize that those advances run the risk of regression, of going backwards, of not accepting. And here we need to take into consideration the identification of which are these forces, these forces that do not allow that this right to human dignity, that is what Commissioner Margaret said, to a society, real, equalist, real equal society in terms of equality. So which are those forces and which is that we can do, which are the arguments that we have to use to face those positions and to hinder this uh, advancement in terms of a real equality. The right we are speaking about is the right to equality. And in this right, there cannot be any type of element that is used against it or let alone the, the loss or the institutional order of a country to place the human collective of people LGBTQ I pass there is a e there, there is an I that I I am a little bit confused with this expression, with this I, but uh, we can we can then talk about it. We can look at it in detail. So the commitment of the commission is in certain thematic reports that we have made, and uh, we. It's important to have these spaces with a public hearing where not only the people here present on the screen, but there is also a lot of people who are listening to us through the different media. And these are forums for the region to reflect on which rights we are speaking about whenever we speak about the protection of people or of these collectives and that these really needs the state to review their regulations to adapt those regulations so that they're in compliance with the human rights treaties they have ratified. I believe that our argument has to be the following. I'm not speaking about conservative groups. I'm speaking about anti-rights groups. I am speaking about groups that do not recognize which what our own religious um, rules state which is to recognize other people and uh, recognize equality and not to discriminate so we have to be ready to have those arguments ready for the protection of the dignity of all human rights this is our responsible our responsibility for us to comply with these uh, treaties so i commit myself to always accompany you, to be together with you in this struggle. Thank you, Madam President. Now I will get the floor to Commissioner Roberta Clark. Thank you very much, Commissioner Mantia, and good afternoon, everyone. Really wonderful to be here with you. I think I've been with with, with many of you all um, over different moments in the year. Uh, this is my first year as a commissioner and also as the 
uh, Rapporteur for the Rights of LGBTI Persons. And I was last in Guyana with um, Joel and Melina. So I'm just happy to be with you all, all together. I, I think first I want to say the studies that were presented from the um, CSO representatives from the Caribbean are really important because I think they give, they start to provide a really firm basis for tracking um, the real experiences of people as the LGBTI persons as they confront discrimination in their lives. And, and, and that discrimination, of course, is very much rooted in the criminalization. And many of you all said that over and over. So I think the studies are important. They're important for the advocacy. They're important for the policy policy reform. And, and also making the connections that discrimination leads to violence, but also leads to other kinds of harm. Economic exclusion that you spoke about, discrimination on the basis of in, in, in accommodation. I think a lot of people don't think about that. You know, they, they're stuck in a kind of a space of thinking about sexuality, but which of course is important, but they're not thinking about all the other impacts of, in the lives of LGBTI persons. So to be able to make those impacts really clear and grounded in, in, in evidence is important. And, and the thing about uh, studies also really important is that they break silence. And we are seeing we're amongst the LGBTI organizations all over the Caribbean and the Americas breaking that silence through advocacy, but now breaking that silence through research and also breaking the silence through services. And I really want to commend, I heard the, 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 the representatives from Kaiso and I think Saswat as well speaking about not only um, the, the, the legal aid, the, the, the psychosocial support, and the community outreach that you do, all of which are very important to opening the, the, opening the discourse around equality and non-discrimination, which is so fundamental for all of us in all of our constitutions. So really important that work that CSOs are doing, which amongst ending the silence and really forcefully articulating everybody's right to a dignified life. Um, I think the interesting uh, issue here, when you think about what the Caribbean uh, CSOs have said, as opposed to what the CSOs from some parts of Latin America have said, those speaking about Panama, whether they speak about Panama or Argentina or Bolivia, um, a number of other countries, Colombia that were referenced, where there's been significant progress, certainly in decriminalization, but also in some of the countries progress in uh, recognizing the right to gender identity, which by the way, I think the Caribbean is a little well far behind on that. So that's also something we have to, to think about. Um, how do we get all countries to comply, not only in the letter of the law, but also in the spirit of, I'm sorry, the advisory opinion 24 of 2017, the Inter-American Court's advisory opinion. But notwithstanding the legal development in many parts of Latin America, we see there's a, there can be in some countries a lag behind uh, the decriminalization and the non-discrimination in law, even in policy and, and as opposed to culture. So notwithstanding the criminalization, uh, LGBTI persons still face, I think some of you said it, uh, abuse of police authority, stigma and discrimination in access to services, including health services, still experience discrimination at the hands of um, landlords in relation to accommodation. So we do know that the work that has to be done is is on many fronts, but certainly a change in the law is not sufficient by itself. It's a precondition for equality, but by itself, it won't necessarily take us to where we want to get to, which is fully, um, full non-discrimination and accountability, especially on the part of non-state actors for discriminatory acts. So I just want to, to recognize the complexity of the issue. And I, because I, I do want to give a, a, a President Mantia her time to talk, uh, I want to ask one question. I, maybe for, for everyone who's here, what are your main strategies? So in the Caribbean, the strategies have to do with the continued need for law reform. Um, in other parts, both of decriminalization as, as well as the right to gender identity, in other parts it's about the cultural change. What are your main strategies and how can the commission be of support in advancing these strategies? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam Commissioner. I really appreciate it. I have a couple of things to say. First of all, I would like to thank you all for being here. 
and let's remember the inter-American standards because as all the general law, it has a debt to the uh, LGBTQI community. And let's remember uh, violence per prejudice. There's a case in Peru with regards to that and how the, um, Belen, let's remember the Belém do Pará Convention after the Vicky Honduras case. And let's remember this because it's very important for justice operators and for LGBTI activists to um, be aware of this. There is a recent uh, report about a differentiated approach on persons deprived of their liberty, which focuses on the situation of uh, LGBTQI plus three persons, remembering the principle of separation. And it's important because the discrimination and the violence that exists outside the prison, they are exacerbated within the prison, right? And that leads to another important concept that was developed in terms of the rights of women, gender stereotypes, how women who commit a crime receive heavier sen sentences, for example. And that goes hand in hand with the situation of LGBTQI plus persons. And I have a question, or maybe it's a reflection, and I would like to listen to you all with all due respect, because I think that in, in these issues, a respectful debate is always very important. And there are positions, in particular in the case of trans women, that question Belém do Pará, that even question the use of uh, inclusive language, and even Beyond the standards of the courts, I wanted to ask how you are dealing with this issue, what your opinions are, considering the feminist movement and all of the debates we are seeing. I would like to know about that. And I would like to um, agree with my colleagues. We want to appreciate and acknowledge your work from all parts of the region. It's because you uh, are showing us the continuity in gender discrimination. I'm thinking of uh, children, of children who are uh, the children of same-sex couples and the high costs in terms of migration for a migrant person with a gender identity law in their own country with documents and then migrate to a different country with no gender identity law and they ask them for uh, an ID that does not reflect their gender identity. Those are the macro problems. So if you have any information as, as uh, we were saying, we would like to know how the commission can work with you. I will give the floor to the executive secretary because she asked for a couple uh, for some minute to, um, to ask a question. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon. I would like to uh, uh, thank you for the information you have provided, but also the activism you do, the advocacy work you do, because what you're showing us today is how the sex category is constantly being renewed, but the legal order or the, the law is not really renewed and doesn't know how to update itself and how to ensure rights. The law is usually facing the challenge of recognizing or not recognizing uh, sexual diversity it is unaware of. And I think that you are bringing to the table uh, a proof of how intersectionality affects us when these uh, legal norms do not recognize certain things because the cultural context leads to the non-recognition of some rights. So as my predecessors said, I would like to ask you, how would you be more supported by the commission? For example, in 2020, we issued a report on trans and diverse gendered persons and their economic, social, and cultural rights. So we have an, an, an approach here that has to do with the interdependency of rights. And we are holding these hearings, which are a great opportunity for us to have a dialogue and aware 
always looking at our cases and petitions for precautionary measures, but we would also like to know about your advocacy strategies to better know how to keep on supporting you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madam Executive Secretary. Now we will give the floor to the organizations. You have 30 minutes. Thank you, uh, commissioners, for your very thoughtful interventions. Um, there was a lot um, to digest. And um, I want to reflect on some of the questions. And then one of my colleagues um, from the coalition will also uh, speak to some of the questions as well. Um, I will start in the order that the questions came. Um, with respect to the qu question from C Commissioner McCauley, um, in addition to working at the America's level as a coalition, of LGBTI and sex workers organizations since 2007, um, heavily around what our regional strategies should be. We have the opportunity, particularly when we gather in person around the OES General Assemblies, to learn from each other's strategies, to learn from different parts of the region. Um, and that's an important space for us to learn from our colleagues from Latin America about what the strategies that you're using there and how effective those can be. Um, particularly when it comes to the issue of legal recognition of gender identity. Um, there are very good um, lessons to be learned from countries like Argentina and Chile. And those are the countries that we in the Caribbean are looking to for good practices, for good models when it comes to those particular issues, um, um, at least at the Americas region. But in addition to that, in the Caribbean sub-region, if you will, um, there's a very active pan-Caribbean network that's called Cari Flags, the Caribbean Forum for Liberation and Acceptance of Genders and Sexualities. And Cari Flags plays a key role, particularly in helping to develop activist capacity. Its flagship program is a leadership academy, which it has been running for the last few years, bringing activists together pre-pandemic in person for training on advocacy, on strategy um, and, and, and that kind of learning. And that has been an important part of sustaining our movements in the regions as we develop on younger activists and expose younger activists to training that uh, many of the older activists didn't get, they just kind of jumped into it. Um, so that's been a very important part of our sustainability um, as a Caribbean movement and how we develop um, youth activists and their capacity to engage around these issues. Um, further to that, more sub-regionally, uh, Kaiso in Trinidad and, and Sassau in Guyana have a long history of working together for over 10 years. Um, when the, the polls that we spoke about, the first ones done in our countries were done together um, by the Caribbean Research Development Institute in Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana and Barbados. And we were able to do a, a second poll nine years later this year. And I know that Kaiso is looking to do another poll um, at least by next year, 10 years later to see where they are on public attitudes. So there's a great deal of cooperation and working together um, both at the hemispheric level, um, at the Caribbean sub-regional -region, level and even sub-regionally among other groups. There are other sub-regional organizations that exist particularly ECAID, which works particularly among the smallest states in the Eastern Caribbean. And it is true that kind of collaboration cooperation. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. We're having an audio problem. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure what to do. Is it any better? Fine. Now it's fine. Fine. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I was saying that um, some of this sub regional organizing has been very effective in resulting in decriminalization um, through the courts, um, particularly in Antigua and, and St. Lucia. And that was born out of a sub regional strategy developed by ECAID, where cases were launched in five Eastern Caribbean states, um, including Barbados, um, a couple of years ago. In terms of the question that um, Commissioner Clark asked about our strategies and what role the commission can play, 
I think in particular, um, from our perspective and the English speaking Caribbean, the relevant strategies that um, we can engage with the commission and work with the commission around are threefold. Public education um, is very critical. Um, we've been able to achieve the progress in improvement of attitudes that my colleague Melina spoke about over the last years because of a great investment in educating the public um, to change norms through lots of public education projects and campaigns, reaching people on mass media, social media, um, house to house engagements, going into communities and having conversations with people. Um, it's taken time, um, but it shows that change is possible um, with the investment of time and resources and the investment in education is useful. And we see that in our context that that investment has re uh, resulted in significant shifts in public opinion way ahead of, of the laws that we have. And we're of course using that data, um, which we've only launched on the 20th of September. So exactly a month today to engage policymakers and on that. And as soon as our parliament reconvenes, this is something that we intend to uh, bring to our attention of our parliament, which has been on a, a recess for the past month or so. Um, so I think public education is an important part of it. And a big part of that is that we also recognize that the state has a responsibility. Human rights education is a state responsibility. And the state has massive resources for human rights education at its disposal. State media, in my context, in my country, means the state has lots of radio stations, um, a television station that re that covers most of the country, more of the country than any private radio than any private television station ca covers. Sorry, um, a national newspaper. All of these are resources that the state can use, that can the state can lend towards public education efforts. And I think the commission engaged in the state to also recognize that human rights education is really the state responsibility and not the responsibility of civil society can convince the state to come on board and work with us on public education. That is what I would like to see. I would like to see us being able to have some of our, ad, our, our, our advertisements, our public service announcements, our education messages on state media um, at no cost to us. The state must also make investments um, in human rights education. And I think that will take some convincing. And I think the commission is poised to, to engage um, with state actors on, on coming on board with supporting public education in this regard. Um, of course, lobbying and advocacy, um, and that could take many forms when you do your country visits, speaking with governments at every opportunity that you have. But particularly, one was also mentioned by one of the commissioners, which is country hearings on these issues, when governments do participate, provide a lot of opportunity for dialogue. And that was something that in Guyana, um, we have benefited from state hearings, um, public country hearings, particularly between 2013 and 20, 2019 or so, having hearings in 2013, 2015, 2017, and then 2019, every two years. And in fact, to the point where the last hearing, um, the government didn't participate, the previous administration didn't participate, but put out a very controversial statement saying that um, the laws criminalizing same-sex intimacy should go to a referendum. And it's because of that public outrage and that public outcry <laughs> in response to that thematic hearing on rights affecting young people in Guyana, um, they withdrew that statement. So you see the value of, of the country hearings in bringing the government to a place where we can have um, a sober dialogue on the particular issues. So I think those are, the key areas in which the Commission can work with us to really engage um, the state to advance these efforts against criminalization. I want to ask my colleagues from Latin America to respond particularly to the comments and questions from the President of the Commission. Oh, thank you. In relation to the questions posed by the commissioners, I would like to say that the, these are part of our activism. The regulations that allows 
for the exclusion of these groups, we are referring to the different regulations and the codes that as was said, there is still language which is strictly anti-law, anti-rights in their terms, in their formulation. So we need to renew those regulations and standards. On the other hand, and something, and something that I believe the Commission can help with is to generate information that the state produces in terms of the judicial uh, information against uh, of the violence against trans people. So we believe that to think of the construction construction of a society with a human rights perspective, the state has to publish official statistics that can show the different forms of sexual orientation, sexual diversity. And even though in Argentina we have really great achievements thanks to the activism, we need to um, show the exercise of those rights and we need uh, for it to, to be, ne it is necessary to allow the people to enjoy these rights and we need to transform the practices which are historically marked by um, the, the, the different chauvinist practices such as the police and the judiciary who are a lot of them. I would like to answer to Commissioner Clark, well in Panama we try to do a lot everything. We try to do campaign to help with strategic litigation in different spaces, political engagement. We try to bet on a social change, which is really difficult. It's the most difficult thing. It's difficult to change the stigma due to different aspects we were, but that were already mentioned in this hearing that go beyond the work we can do because it's something cultural, but that is what we are trying to work on. However, the Pro the problem lies, I'm going to focus on Panama, but I'm speaking of other countries as well, but when we have an executive, legislative and judiciary power that does, does not comply with human rights, we are in problem. And that is why we come to spaces such as these to make visible a problem of uh, regression. We thought that we would move forward in several topics, um, but this hasn't been the case. We have had in Panama a uh, regression and we, have, we haven't had the luck of Costa Rica or Ecuador or Bolivia. In Panama and in other Central American countries, we have moved backwards. I mentioned here that after the last period of session 177 in 2017, the Panamanian state uh, committed to establish a work table after that, they, the, the Panamanian state haven't met with the civil society what, to discuss what we have asked at that time to um, uh, abolish the code of the police and to start having conversations in order to um, uh, finally uh, include in the law the uh, laws on same-sex same, same sex marriage, for instance. And so I would also like to say that you can help us uh, to call upon the state so that they follow up on their commitment, at least in the hearings that are here, that many of the, the, the organizations have presented all these things, all, all these reports to the state. We need the commission to follow up the state and to exert pressure so that in those topics that the state have committed to do, uh, they do it. I think it's quite a joke that we have come here three times and the Panamanian state has, hasn't, meet with us, hasn't met with us one single time. In relation to what Commissioner Mantilla was saying as to the groups that oppose to conventions such as Belém do Pará, for us, this is a very concerning topic, worrying, because we are speaking about feminist organizations which are widely recognized 
that converge with the groups that we also call anti-rights because definitely that's what they're saying they're doing these trans excluding groups generally speak about the erasure of women with a wrong conception on as to where the uh, perception of the women comes from so they are not speaking about patriarchy or the um oppression of women there is a, a social also um, a social recognition of recognizing women only as women and they have also used this expression of rights based on gender and we would like to state that that the rights based on sex human rights are equal for everybody with no distinction they are not based on sex and the violations on human rights upon the violation of human rights which are which is differentiated but serve several characteristics and in that sense trans people uh, find serious violation to their human rights that are manifested in the case of trans women as it as it was seen in the case of Vicky Hernandez in an extreme cruelty because there is not only death but also torture in the case of uh, trans men cruelty appears as sexual violence also uh, homicide but also sexual violence and the violation of their social cultural economic and cultural rights and they are one of the populations which are not visibilized so that is why our coalition coalition asked for a hearing to talk about trans masculinity masculinities and how to prioritize this topic we present a lot of topics but within these topics we know that some of them are more urgent than other have been less visible than others trans masculinities need us to focus on them and in the case of children trans children also cruelty is extreme they are prevented from having uh, cultural representation in the tv there cannot be a trans character and that that leaves them unprotected and we believe that we are defending the rights of children in general and all rights have uh, all children have right to live a life without violence so whether this come from uh, the the rightist movements or from the revolutionary feminist movements they uh, violate the rights of people and we would like to reiterate what we were mentioning in terms of the judiciary because we talk about public policies our region is heterogeneous there are countries where the legislation is still criminalizing in others the protection is omitted and in others there is protection but the working of the judiciary is conservative in the whole region and it is funded on a, a patriarchal heterosexist um, structure with judges that are judges for life and it's impossible to change their uh, ideas so we should have more training in the judiciary we need them to be accountable and to work on the judiciary. I will close here so as to leave some time for my colleague. Thank you. Good afternoon once more. In terms of strategies, when you ask for strategies, well, Venezuela Igualitaria has worked in all the chapters and in all the uh, instances possible nationally. Nationally, we have acted in the National Assembly um as to same-sex marriage and the, also the demand that brought us to this here in the decriminalization the article 565 of the criminal of the code of uh, military code there was a reform which was proposed and we tried to do advocacy so that this modification was done but this did not happen last year so as i was saying adopting the different instances and we reach the uh, supreme court which is the maximum court in our uh, 
judiciary and nothing has occurred. And even though Venezuela has re announced its participation in the Inter-American Commission and due to this situation, we know that the, the petitions of these courts may not be binding for Venezuela and but in even participating in this hearing um, may mean that we are then persecuted, but our commitment with our LGBTI population, we don't care whatever uh, retaliation we have, but we want uh, to know how the Inter-American Commission can help us and can work with us because this is our first instance outside our country. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. We are reaching the end of the hearing. And I would like to thank you not only for your presence here today, uh, listening to what Giovanni was saying, your daily struggle. You have had this space, but what you do in their uh, communities and the follow-up of these communities may also pose your life at risk. But I believe that this is part of your history of life. I would like to remind you what the court has already said that I know you already know this, but this uh, hearing is being streamed. In the case, Marine, the violence against LGBTI people, it is based in discrimination for people who are different and these are uh, people who are, uh, this type of violence can be promoted by those people that consider to defy the rules of gender. So the court says this and the commission agrees. We were we will keep on working. Thank you for this frank dialogue. The commission has a lot to reflect on, has a lot to work in the compliance of other standards. And I also would like to thank when uh, we were hearing Giovanni when they spoke about this crime of cowardice. And I believe that there cannot be nothing more brave to struggle for rights, for your rights, for be who one is. So I would like to thank you for what you do and thank you for because each of you has a child inside that developed and that had to face many people and maybe they did not have the follow-up that you are giving to those people right now and thank you to all the members of the community and so that all the children can see this video the human rights do not depend on the gender expression it depends on our essence and that is what the commission reaffirms and reasserts i really respect your struggle because each case, each hearing is achieved with the life, with blood, the pain of many of you. So thank you. I close this hearing and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you, everyone.